Welcome everybody to the Good Data Podcast. Today is episode seven of our green series. Second to last one, people. If you stuck it out, this is the one that matters most to almost all of you. And it was a long journey, but it's worth it in the end, I think. I'm compiling this entire series into an ebook, which will be available on Amazon. Look for that in the fall of 2019. Uh, brief overview on the green series. We started with software, zoomed out to the server hardware, to electrical systems, and then we took a digression into the philosophy behind green data centers. Then we moved out to automation and efficiency. And here we are today looking at green cooling. If you're interested in reducing your carbon footprint as a data center operator, this is the place to be. You've made it. Next week, we will take off from this topic in order to discuss kinetic edge data centers. Then the week after that, we'll be talking with Keith Perry, principal at DAO Technologies. That was a great interview. After that will be our last episode of the series, which is energy reclamation. Really looking forward to that one. Let's go. Today is a big episode because cooling is the biggest opportunity for savings for data center operators. Cooling takes up the most energy apart from actually running these servers and the servers aren't going to go away. So getting rid of any percentage of cooling really makes a difference. When we talk about PUE, for the most part we're talking about mechanical PUE, the actual power utilization effectiveness of the cooling systems. And <clears throat> that's calculated as the total amount of energy used by the data center divided by the IT energy. So that's usually a number between, I'll say, 1.3 and 3. So the lower the number, the better. 3 is terrible. That means you're using uh, 3 times the amount of energy uh, than is actually used in the actual server hardware. So you're using the server hardware plus two times that. And that is still the norm in a lot of data centers. And I would not be surprised if somebody is listening to this from a small or medium business. If you have a data center, I would not be at all surprised if you're operating it a three. Uh, or even worse, if you're a fairly large data center, uh, especially government institutions that I've seen or sometimes financial institutions, because of the level of redundancy that's there, sometimes those things are just very inefficient and they've been built on top of themselves many, many times. So the systems just are not built for the current equipment that's in them. And... This has just been a problem over and over and over again. A lot of times the underfloor wasn't created for the capacity. So it was a 18 inch raised floor when really they need so much more CNFM than that now. So there's lots of options in the cooling department, lots of opportunities for improvement. Let's just break it down this way. We're gonna work, instead of we were doing for this entire series, working from the chip outward, we're gonna take it from the outside and work back in. So <clears throat> where does, how do you get rid of the heat? How do you expel it out of the data center and into the world? It's called heat rejection. And there's gotta be a way with any type of data center to get the heat that is in the room out of the room. Usually it's done, or at least you know, in, in history, it was done using air conditioners, uh, usually called crack units or computer room air conditioners. And they ran on a direct expansion system. So <clears throat> they would run the air from the room over cooling coils, you know, basically uh, big copper pipes that are running through fins that take 
the warmth from the air and transfer that into the copper pipes. And inside those copper pipes is a refrigerant liquid um, that then when it gets heated up, it actually turns into a gas and then leaves the building and is then cooled down outside and using a compressor is actually turned back into a liquid. So that's probably the least efficient type of cooling out there. And it's also mm, some of the most prevalent in most facilities. Um, and one of the biggest problems with it is that it has a huge volume of refrigerant. This is the system that probably has the largest volume refrigerant per kW heat rejected. And the problem with refrigerant itself is that it has a global warming potential just all on its own. So for instance, the most common these days refrigerant for data centers is R410A. And R410A, if it's released into the atmosphere, actually causes over 2,000 times as much global warming, at least as identified by uh, the, the current sort of crop of scientific knowledge, that the global warming per, per profile of R410A is 2,088 times worse than just carbon dioxide. So you talk about the release of carbon dioxide. That is still the most prevalent greenhouse gas, but the refrigerants that we're talking about are actually in some ways much worse. Um, and this is true of a lot of gases, it's not just refrigerants, but the refrigerants that are being deprecated actually sometimes had a less of a global warming potential, like uh, R R22, which is being deprecated for other reasons, including that it's a greenhouse or it's an ozone depletion agent, uh, had like 1800 as opposed to 2100. So there's always a give and take with that sort of thing. Um, and there are some other refrigerants that are very commonly used, but aren't really used in data centers just because of the cooling characteristics that they have that don't have any global warming potential. So for instance, um, ammonia has zero global warming potential, happens to be toxic, and it happens to get way too cold to really be useful in data centers. But it is a different type of refrigerant that is available. And also <laughs> like uh, isobutane or <laughs> um, uh, there are that is actually a fantastic refrigerant. It also gets things really cold, but it's also super flammable. It's used a lot in a lot of industrial applications as a refrigerant. Um, it's used in, let's say, turbines and things like that. So it's it's certainly used, but uh, <laughs> and it, it has almost zero global warming potential. But you don't use it in data centers because you don't want your data center blowing up. And the problem with all this is that refrigerant does leak. It does, you know, pipes are not perfect. They do open up and release gas into the atmosphere. And uh, these are gases that some of them do boil at room temperature. So they just turn into gas right away. And um, it it is another vector of problematic global warming from data centers. It's not nearly as much as uh, producing the carbon in, in terms of tons, because you measure the amount of refrigerant in these systems generally by pounds, not tons. So it's it's minuscule compared to the carbon output, but it's still there. Now, I should note that we're talking about direct expansion here, and uh, that as a technology is the simplest type of refrigerant, but most of the heat rejection that we're going to talk about is actually using some form of refrigerant in it. Uh, a lot of times that refrigerant is going through a chiller, which is just a very large uh, but very contained piece of refrigerant. So so uh, water on one side gets cooled down really uh, effectively through the chiller 
and the heat from that chiller then gets put into uh, a condensed water system which will then go out to a cooling tower or something like that so we'll, we'll get to that in a second um, <clears throat> but there are most of the technologies that I'm going to talk about actually do have a refrigerant piece to them so the next one is dry coolers now dry coolers are pretty inefficient as well they are basically just fans they're outside that are blowing over coils so we, we talked about inside of the data center there is a fan that's blowing over coils that's getting the heat into the water and then outside there's a fan running over coils that's getting the heat out of those coils and into the air now <clears throat> dry coolers are a weird one because they they can be somewhat efficient you can actually use them to have a economizer cycle so that you can run in the winter time if it's cold enough you can just run the water from the dry coolers uh, through a secondary coil in a crack unit and that can cause savings but it is not the ideal I don't think uh, the, especially at the temperatures that most data centers run at data centers often run very cold and we'll get to that in a minute if they were to run warmer most of these would be more efficient than they are so another um, type of cooling is a cooling tower which is actually taking water and running it over the fins and tubes the uh, coils and um, <clears throat> then blowing air through it so that it evaporates and that is actually very effective at cooling the coils because when the water evaporates it takes energy to evaporate the water so it pulls that energy out of those coils and that uh, is in a way free cooling in that you don't have to uh, do any compression to make that happen it's just the evaporation of the water takes energy with it and it's almost like just when you get sprayed with a mist you can feel it get colder that's an adiabatic effect and uh, adiabatic means that there's actually no change in the total amount of energy it's just that the energy is changing from uh, the actual heat energy that is in the pipe and it's changing to the potential energy of uh, being a gas so it it is a phase change the you know phases of matter are solid liquid gas and it is change when you change from one to the other it t takes energy to make that change happen so making that evaporative process is always going to be an efficient way to transfer heat and that's why refrigerants work uh, like we were saying in the pipes it will evaporate inside of that pipe and take a lot of heat with it so cooling towers are a type of indirect adiabatic cooling so cooling towers take heat they uh, put it into the water that runs over them and that goes up into the atmosphere there's also direct adiabatic cooling which would just be the simplest idea of it is just spraying mist into uh, the air and then blowing a lot of air past it and that mist takes the heat out of the air and cools it down and um, in a very dry climate you can actually just take outside air run it through a mist or through a evaporative medium with water flowing over it and it'll just cool down the air and it works great it's incredibly efficient it is um, uh, very cost-effective as long as water is not too expensive but it does use a lot of water because you're you're not recycling that water it's just going in it's actually going into your data center it's going into the room and it's increasing the humidity of that room so if you're in a wet climate 
like we're in the Northeast, so <laughs> this is not a good place for that direct adiabatic cooling because it's always it's almost always either going to be too cold outside for it to make a difference or it's too wet so you're going to just be too humid and at a certain point you can't evaporate any more water so it just it doesn't work as well here but in phoenix or los angeles it's perfect it's it can work very well now there <laughs> So the those types of systems, a lot of them use water because water is a very effective heat conductor and has a high, uh, it can store a lot of water, it can store a lot of heat inside of it. Uh, and it allows for that kind of free cooling concept. But you can also just basically pump the heat into the ground <laughs> uh, and it's, you know in, in a way it's it's geothermal cooling um, if let's say you are you have a data center that's over an aquifer that has water in it sometimes that aquifer is cold water uh, you know it depends on where you are but it, you could just pump that cold water into your data center and then pump it back into another well and suddenly you have free cooling. You know, all you're doing is pumping cold water. Uh, also, Google did this in a uh, Nordic site where they pumped river water through their data center cooling, and that actually very effectively cooled the data center without having to waste water. The problem with pulling it from a stream is that you got a lot of fish. And a lot of those fish are going to die. You need a whole lot of scrubbing. Uh, you, you know, the fish are going to get pulled into this well. You have to make sure that uh, whatever bio growth is going through gets killed and cleaned off. Um, it is not simple. And the actual work to purify that water is pretty labor, is resource intensive. So... The amount that you're saving on the cooling, a lot of that goes into the resource of just cleaning the water. So it's a complicated one. <laughs> it's not simple to do that kind of cooling. And it's not available anywhere, everywhere because not everywhere has cold streams running by. Um, however, everywhere on Earth has air. So the next type of air uh, uh, heat rejection would just be direct air, basically having big fans that blow the air out of the space and just get rid of it. And this can be used as a supplement to your other types of systems so that when the temperature is cold enough, the building automation system turns on these big fans and just bypasses whatever system you're using. And it could also just be your main method of heat rejection and that is becoming more and more common in situations like cryptocurrency mining where you just need the cheapest amount of cooling possible and that's the only one that really makes sense if you have you have to have an awful lot of air moving through and you also have to design your system in such a way that you're not bypassing air so you're not just short circuiting and taking the cold air that you're bringing outside and just dumping it right out through your exhaust fans into the outside so that it's not actually doing any work that's not helping anybody we have to take a break we'll be back in a moment on good data today's episode is brought to you by green lane design green lane has been designing engineering and building critical facilities for over 10 years including major enterprise customers as well as co-location facilities GLD has designed and developed an integrated stack of design disciplines. If you would be interested in a free assessment, go to greenlanedesign.com, click on contact, and mention the podcast. And we're back. That is going to lead into our next topic, which is uh, what happens in the room. So we're talking about airflow. Air is 
the biggest friend and biggest enemy of data center cooling. Air in the data center is the lifeblood. You can almost think of a data center as being a living thing, and the, and the crack units, the cray units, are the lungs of the data center, and they are moving that air through, getting that heat away, and in almost every data center, that is one of the hardest things that people have to deal with because <laughs> for a long time nobody cared because there just wasn't enough power in a data center to have to worry about it. So they would just put racks willy-nilly all over the place and sometimes the hot air of one rack would be blowing right on the intake of another rack and then that would be blown onto the next rack and then that would be blown onto the next rack and you'd have this <laughs> increasing heat load as you go on down the line. And so they realized at one point that they should alternate so that there was a cold aisle and a hot aisle so that the air would go into the cold aisle and then go through the servers and then go into the hot aisle. And one hot aisle would abut the next row of racks on their hot side so that the hot air would just go up towards the ceiling and collect there. And somebody realized that that was a much more efficient type of cooling. And that went hand in hand with the idea of, well, if we do that, then we need to get the cooling where we want it to be. And since we move these racks around a lot, why don't we put the cooling under the floor and put graded tiles on the floor so that the air would come up through these graded tiles and go to the server units. And that was the definition of a data center for probably 30 years. It's a raised floor with air going through it and going through the racks and then going up to the ceiling. And that was better than the previous version where racks were just strewn about willy-nilly, but hot aisle, cold aisle, just on its own with air distribution under the floor creates a whole host of problems. Um, one is that you really have to pressurize that floor and make it one big duct to get the air where it needs to be. And that means that you're essentially compressing the air into a smaller volume and just working the fans pretty hard. And even then, you don't even necessarily, and there's leaks through the floor. You're not necessarily getting the exact airflow you need because that air is moving so fast that it creates these vortices, like just like a tornado under the floor that will sometimes, literally, I've, I've had a piece of paper, put it down on a, on a vented floor tile, and it got sucked down into the vented floor tile because the air was moving so fast or there was a vortex that was negatively pressurized and pulling that air back down into the floor. And that's hard to predict. We have tools like uh, computational fluid dynamics software that can predict that kind of stuff. But even that is complicated and difficult to do. And it really needs to be done on a consistent basis over time. And not many people do that. So there are some rules of you know, rules of thumb that I'll, I'll give you right now, but just as a whole, underfloor distribution is not that efficient. Um, partially because you're fighting regular convection. Air wants to, cold air wants to fall and hot air wants to rise. So your cold air isn't falling, it's being forced to rise up, which in a lot of ways doesn't make sense. It'd be, make more sense in many ways for it to fall down. Um, but some rules of thumb about underfloor distribution. Uh, <clears throat> one is that um, fast moving air has a lower pressure. So if you're very close to one of your cooling units, that air will be moving very, very fast, which means that it may suck the air down towards it if you put a, a tile right next to that air conditioning unit. So you want to usually put your hot aisle uh, in front of your air conditioning unit so that your cold aisles are a little bit farther away. Uh, even then, though, sometimes the air is still moving very fast near that crack unit, uh, in which case you can put baffles to redirect the air. That's not that easy to do because it, it's not always obvious how 
it's basically just putting up a tiny wall in uh, some place to uh, change the speed of air so that it slows down or speeds up where you want it to be. That's really hard to do. <laughs> I've done it, and I, I've used computational fluid dynamics software to tell me where that baffle goes. And when you do it right, it works really well. But just doing it by trial and error it is actually probably the best way to do it because then you can see, you know, you, you take a, a bolometer, an airflow meter, and you put it where it needs to be and see if it helps. Uh, but it actually takes forever, and it's a real pain. Um, so, you know, you can basically try to make sure that you don't open up your floor too much because then you don't have any pressure. So if you put down too many uh, vented floor tiles, then you are taking away the total air pressure of that floor plenum, the, the total, you know, the, the volume under the floor that delivers the air to where it needs to be. So you need to make sure that you balance the vented floor tiles. Sometimes you can put dampers on those vented floor tiles to put that air where it needs to be. But nobody controls those dampers over time so that kind of sucks too you can also get fans in your vented floor tiles that will automatically adjust to add more air to a given rack but those are expensive and you wouldn't want to put those at every rack and it's almost like you're putting good money after bad because you're you're doubling up in your fans that way so I, I could go on about the problems with uh, floor distribution for air. The one one thing that is actually helpful that um, I was a little late to the party on is um, directional airflow tiles. Some tiles can actually m be made to have vents that push the air towards the rack, and uh, that does a couple things. One is that it uh, doesn't bypass the the servers at the bottom of the rack. Uh, it actually gets the air directly to those servers. Also, it uh, creates turbulence in the flow of air, and turbulence actually um, is good in this kind of situation. It, it helps the air to get to where it needs to be, whereas if you have a laminar flow, it, it will tend to bypass the rack entirely and just go up to the ceiling. Um, <clears throat> so I almost could go on just about air distribution in a data center, uh, you know, putting the floor tiles where they need to be. Uh, at one point, I created a program that did a Monte Carlo simulation to figure out where the tile should be in a given data center. And that actually was really helpful. Uh, and it, it worked pretty well. <laughs> but then I would have to check it again with CFD. So it was just like a uh, indicator it wasn't perfect. So so that really should point to the idea that CFD is, is not the easiest thing and you have to know how to use it. Um, so how do you fix that? How do you not worry about the floor? Well, you do that using containment, which is putting doors at the end of your racks, you, you at the end of your rack rows. You can close the cold aisle in or you can close the hot aisle in or you could close both but regardless the idea is to make sure that the hot air and the cold air do not mix so that really the the key benefit of that is uh twofold one is that you're not getting that hot air back into the intake of the servers and two it's that you are getting the hottest air back to your heat rejection system. So heat rejection works the best when you have a high temperature delta, when you have hot, basically, I mean, it works best when you have hot air going back to your heat rejection. Uh, coils just work best that way. Phase change just works the best that way. It, it really is effective um, to get really hot air back to those air conditioning units. And the best way to do that is with hot aisle containment, not cold aisle containment. And <laughs> let's just talk about hot aisle containment because uh, in, in just about every way, hot aisle containment is the preferred 
means of containing airflow in the data center, uh, especially for a new data center. Old data centers, sometimes you just can't. It's just the way that the racks are laid out, you can't contain the hot aisle, in which case, you know, just bite your lip and, and contain the cold aisle. But everywhere else, hot aisle is so much better. So let's talk about it. So first thing, hot aisle containment gets the hottest air back to your air conditioning uh, because you are not having a large volume of hot air for it to, for it to then cool down again. Uh, you're getting that hot air directly back to the air conditioning and uh, quickly. And that really is just efficient. Also, when you walk into the room, it's not hot. It's, it's the right temperature. <laughs> it feels more comfortable. It works more effectively with an exhaust fan system because you're just getting that heat directly out of the system and uh, you're not getting any of the, you know, colder air mixing in with it. It just works very well in that kind of a situation. Another reason why hot aisle containment is very effective is that it allows the rest of the room to be cold. And so you have this big volume of air that is cold, which means that if all the power goes out, that cold air will remain in the system and it'll heat up over time, but at least it was cold to start. Whereas if you have cold out containment, then the room's hot. And so you're starting with hot air and it's going to eventually get to those servers. So having that big volume of cold air is actually uh, really good for reliability. Um, and so what are some of the difficulties with hot aisle containment? Well, one big one is the ideal gas law, that air expands when it gets hotter. Uh, this is one that a lot of people forget. And uh, Paul Bemis, who I uh, previously interviewed, talked about this. He's, he's very smart about this. But um, as air expands, it will try to find a way to get out of the volume that it's in. So if your hot aisle is too small, it will try to escape back through your server racks. And if your duct or your ceiling return plenum where your hot air gets back to your cooling units is closed off and doesn't have enough room for that hot air to get away, it's going to get stuck in that hot aisle. So you have to make sure that there's a lot of opening in your hot aisle for that air to get where it needs to be. And you can negatively pressurize your hot aisles, um, which you know, you can have a, a small fan that actually feeds back into the cooled space or that feeds into your return plenum, or you have it directly ducted. Uh, directly ducted is probably the best method. But just having a pressure differential is probably the most effective way to do it. And all you really need to do is have the total air volume that's leaving that hot aisle be like one to two percent more air volume than is being put in there by the racks and then you eliminate so many issues you can use a differential pressure sensor to uh, modulate that differential uh, you can even use some kind of baffle or motorized damper uh, it's not that easy to do <laughs> unless it's purpose, purpose built. And, it, you know, that brings us to the next possibility with um, cooling in the row is actually having air conditioners that are about the size of a server rack and putting them in your row. That works really well. It is very efficient. Uh, it can be fairly expensive, but you get very hot air back to those air conditioners, usually called in-row air conditioners or something similar. And 
you get exactly amount the amount of cooling that you need out of each one of those systems and those can be fairly inexpensive they just run off chilled water and they can reject a lot of heat you can increase your density of compute uh, they are effective systems but they can be expensive and you have to make sure that your aisle is contained well you can also have heat rejection on the rear door of your rack which is usually for like high performance computing or things like that where you have a lot of data running through a given rack in that case you know you can have somewhere around 25 30 kw and be able to cool it uh, per rack the expensive of that though is is very high <laughs> it's very expensive to get that so um you know it it is something that is often cost prohibitive so all right that's that's our topic of cooling in the room now let's talk about cooling inside the rack this is one that i think is often overlooked because people who are inside of the rack aren't the same people who are manning the data center often the people who are futzing with the crack units are usually not even touching racks but inside a rack any open hole is going to be attempting to pull air from the hot aisle into the cold aisle and a lot of people don't really think about this but server fans are an airflow system they are pulling air from wherever they can and so if there's a an open U right below one of your servers it's trying to pull air from the cold aisle and also through that open U so plugging any of those holes is going to improve your hot aisle cold aisle containment like crazy more so than putting doors at the end of your racks uh, and you use blanking panels which can be one U they can be sheets of plastic they can be mylar it doesn't matter <laughs> you just get space blankets and do it just so long as you're creating a real actual differential between the air on the hot side and the cold side so that there's no airflow through those open U's or in the cracks of the rack or underneath the racks we've seen very very hot air coming underneath the rack and really overheating those bottom servers in a rack or the top of the rack wherever that airflow is coming it can make a huge difference to that one server and suddenly that server fails and you know you have voided the warranty or something on it so there are other issues with racks themselves one of the big ones comes back from that air distribution that goes under the floor when there is underfloor air distribution a lot of times the cable the PDU plugs or whatever cable is going to that rack is actually going under the floor so if that's the case you actually have to cut a hole in the floor to get the power where it needs to go and that means that all that air that's going in that floor plenum is just going into the bottom of the rack not in the front but in the back so it's doing nothing it's just bypassing that server and wasted it's just complete waste of air because it's getting cold air back to the crack units which is making them run less efficiency which is really costing money <laughs> that is something that we have done for our customers in the past and it has saved them buckets of money and you know it can be very significant amounts of air even through a fairly small space so what you have to do is there are uh, brushed grommets that can reduce that airflow through the floor there are just pillows that are fireproof pillows um, but there are a lot of UL listed materials that can do that uh, we've used a UL listed polypropylene uh, that is um, it has to I think it's NFPA or no I, I'd have to look up what the actual um, standard is that that has to abide by but 
you if you get that um, fire resistant material you can plug that up with just about anything um, <clears throat> but you have to make sure that it's adhered to the floor because it's going to be pushed up by the pressure in the floor so you have to nail it down screw it down glue it down whatever it is and also be able to take it out so you can move the cables when you need to so another thing to realize is that the air needs to get out of the rack so there should be as little blockage in the rear of the rack as is possible that means that cable management, making sure that your cables are neat and tidy and not in the way of your server fans, is crucial. And so many people are terrible at it. And it takes time. And it means that your deployments might be a little bit slower. But if you have a standard for it and you know how you're doing it and you have your cable cut to the right length and you're not just throwing really overly long Cat6 cables or you know, just looping 10-foot cables everywhere within the back of your rack or having uh, 5 million power cords that are going all which this, thing, this way and that, that is actually a help to the efficiency of your data center. And uh, the last uh, that I'd like to say about um, rack cooling is uh, there. there was sort of a trend at one point to use chimneys in rack cooling so you would actually have like an extension on the back of your rack that was all closed in that would then uh, force air up into basically a small duct that would then go into a ceiling return plenum and you call that a chimney uh, <clears throat> that works pretty well when you're up to about 4kw because it gets you know that there's not so much air volume that it's not going to want to go up uh, that chimney via convection. But once you get above that, at what we found at least, uh, that 4kW per rack threshold on those chimneys, you need to have a fan in that chimney because, as we were saying, the air in the chimney side expands and it just wants to get out of that rack however it can. So it is finding any crack that it can between the servers on the on the cold side to get back to the front of that rack unless you actively pull that air out of that chimney to make sure that it gets away uh, and you know just like any exhaust system you usually put that on the end of the duct you know to blow it away so you'd probably put that at the ceiling height to uh, get that exhaust exactly where it needs to be but man, does that not happen very often. That's something that I would love to see happen more often. Uh, I, I think chimneys can work. Uh, there are reasons because of fire code issues. Um, containment in general is a fire code issue. You cannot block the airflow over your racks uh, because your sprinklers have to get to where they need to be unless your sprinkler system was designed with the aisle configuration that you want it to be then you are in violation of fire codes if you contain and block that um, there are very stringent requirements on sprinkler spacing and that's even more important in a data center space as well so there are methodologies that uh, <laughs> I get differing reports based on the jur jurisdiction that we're working in, whether or not they are legal. But uh, you can have what are called fused disconnects for your your containment system, where if, if one of those disconnects gets hot enough, it'll just melt away and the containment will fall down. Uh, the That as far as I understand it, is not allowed by most uh, jurisdictions, and NFPA seems to have frowned on that. Um, but there is also an interlocked system that is electrically controlled that would uh, allow the fuse disconnect, or it would force the fuse disconnect open and either roll up the 
containment or force it to drop away. And that has to be linked into the smoke alarm system. And uh, as soon as smoke is detected, it would roll away or, or drop down. Uh, alternatively, um, there is the idea of melt-away ceilings and containment of that sort. And that, as far as I understand it, as far as my interpretation of the uh, NFPA guidelines, that doesn't fly. Um, because by the point it gets to the meltaway piece, uh, the water might already be flowing and cooling that piece down to a point where the water is not getting to the fire that it needs to get to. Um, <laughs> the fire protection people are very, very conservative and do not want to allow any chance of a fire happening, and rightfully so. Well, so having that closure in your system is problematic. Uh, this goes doubly so for a dry gas fire protection system as well. If there's a dry gas, like an FM200 system, uh, pre or a, um, a clean agent system, you have to make sure that the clean agent is going to get to everywhere it needs to get to. So it needs to have heads, probably extra heads from what you would expect. All of that is to say, <laughs> the containment is difficult and should be designed from the beginning to do be done properly. Well, one thing that we've done is actually uh, put containment up to about 18 inches below the ceiling. Uh, and what that does is it, it does create a effective stratification so that the hot air gets close enough to the ceiling that it's not going to loop back around into the server cabinets. Um, that is very helpful. It's not as good as full containment, but it is very good. And uh, from what we interpret the NFPA guidelines to be is perfectly kosher with the airflow in a rack. So it seems to work that way. Um, and however you do get your containment, just start doing it because it will save you money instantly and it's not that expensive to do. So to zoom in one more level, here we go. The next level is we've talked about the airflow in the room. We talked about the heat exhaustion, the uh, heat rejection out of the building. So now we're at the chip. How do you get the heat away from the chip? Well, one of the first problems that so many data centers have is dust. Dust is a problem for so many reasons, not just because zinc whiskers can short out circuits and, and reduce the equipment life of your servers. Uh, also because dust just makes heat sinks hotter. If you've ever opened up a computer to fix it and you've looked at those copper fins that make up a heat sink on a on a processor those things are dirty as hell they just suck in dust they love dust so having that dust in your server is just heating it up it is making your chip temperature that much hotter it is taking the airflow away from where it needs to be and bypassing the heat sink and just reducing your equipment life by a lot. So having a data center be a clean room is enormously effective. It's very important. Data centers should be clean. You should have blue mats at the door that will take dust off people's shoes. You should make sure that there are no cardboard allowed in the data center. You should make sure that uh, any dust producing materials are kept out of the data center, data centers should be treated like pharmaceutical clean rooms as much as possible. Of course, you're doing tours, you're showing people through, you got your execs coming through, you're not going to do that. But they should at least be cleaned periodically. There are fantastic data center cleaning services out there that that's what they do. And there's 
every reason to get them in annually, semi-annually, just to do a big once-over on making sure that room's clean. Okay, so that's my rant about dust. But once you get to the chip level, pretty much facility operators otherwise don't have to worry about it because you don't open those servers. That's not your job. That's not what you're supposed to be doing unless you're working with a system that is built that way. For instance, liquid cooling. Some systems have water cooling directly to the chip that has a water system that uh, pulls water directly off of the hottest components and then into a chilled water system that will circulate the air within the circulate the water within the rack and then back to a heat exchanger that will put it into the chill water system. And that is a fantastic system. It works exceptionally well, but it's so expensive. <laughs> if you've ever gone into a computer store and they have the most amazing, super chilled, water cooled computer, you can see how uh, they have to have pumps, they have to have expansion chambers, they have, there's so many different pieces to the liquid cooling at a chip level, and plus it could leak. So there's a lot of maintenance, and there's a lot of worry that suddenly you're going to get a leak and your very expensive compute, computer equipment is going to get ruined. So it's pretty rare, and it's really only worthwhile in supercomputers, in like high performance computing situations that are at, you know, the Lawrence Livermore labs. It's not something that your normal data center operator is going to do, but they are so cool. So I just wanted to bring it up. And last but not least from what I'm saying is something that I've probably talked about more than my fair share is immersion cooling. Immersion cooling is when you take a server and actually dunk it into a dielectric fluid. So a fluid that is an electric insulator and let that fluid conduct the heat. So there's no air. It's it's almost like dunking it into a vat of water. It's, it looks like that. You're taking this server and immersing it. And I would call this still an emerging technology because it's just not widely practiced. But I think that eventually more and more systems are going to run on immersion cooling and we better be ready for it. Why do I think that? Well, when you talk about the direction that servers have taken and getting more and more dense, having more and more surface area for computation through GPUs and ASICs and larger, uh, higher core processors, you start to see that things are just getting more and more hot. And there's going to be more and more need to uh, be able to handle 30 kW racks, 50 kW racks. As we move into tensor cores and AI, you can get so many cores on one chip and you got to cool them down. So doing that with immersion cooling is in some ways insanely simple. It is insanely simple to create an immersion cooling system. I took a little, you know computer, a stick computer that's the size of a pack of gum called a Raspberry Pi, and just one day decided to dunk it in some mineral oil and see if it worked, and it worked. It is that simple. You just have to pump this mineral oil or whatever fluid it is. So these are incredibly simple systems. You just take the oil or whatever dielectric fluid, and you run it through some coils to exchange the heat with water or even you could do it with air. And you then get that air, that water and, and reject the heat from it. So 
it's even fewer parts. There's no fans. There's no noise. It's just very simple. And the most complex part is that then you got to deal with oil or whatever liquid you're using, which is a pain in the butt. So I get why it hasn't been adopted very much is that then you got to you know, you got to clean that oil off and then if you want to service anything, you got to let the oil drip off and the oil is hot. It's like going to be 80 degrees centigrade, 85 degrees even. And nobody wants to work in that kind of environment. Um, but I think that the technology is improving. And part of the reason for that is that the it's a chemical process. You're using some kind of chemical, whatever that is, to uh, use as that immersion cooling chemical. So it's a chemistry problem. People are working on that chemistry right now. It wasn't really in the radar. Now it is. People are incredible whizzes at making the absolutely best chemical properties for this sort of thing that don't corrode, that are not fire hazards that can get the absolute best thermal regulation. And eventually somebody's going to figure that out. Um, now there, there are two kinds of immersion cooling. There's, uh, the kind that's just like an oil that is not going to evaporate. And there's, there's kind that will evaporate that, um, when it gets close to the chip, it will actually go from a liquid to a, to a gas and, it will take an awful lot of heat with it. And those are incredibly, incredibly efficient systems that use that evaporative technology. However, they leak. <laughs> uh, the good thing about those is that they tend not to leave a residue on the server when you take it out of the liquid because it just evaporates. So that's great. But then that's a problem too because as soon as you open the lid to that immersion cooling system, you're letting all the fluid out and you're wasting it and a lot of times those things might have like might be global warming gases or something so there's a give and take there but eh, you can already see how how efficient this can be because you're running this liquid at let's say 85 degrees centigrade so 168 i think degrees fahrenheit that's insanely hot compared to the air that you're running. So you can take that hot liquid and you don't even need a chiller. You can just uh, do a heat exchange with water and a cooling tower and it's cooling it enough to get it down to the 75 degrees centigrade or whatever it needs to be to then keep cooling the data center. It's just so simple and efficient and instead of a PUE of 3, you're getting a PUE of 1.03. That's not an exaggeration. You are improving the heat, the cooling of your data center by 100 times. It's 100 times better. Not an exaggeration. There's every reason to do that. <laughs> and it really is the technology that is simplest to get to that 1.03 PUE uh, in my personal estimation but um, and it's clean and it increases the life of uh, the lifespan of the servers and if your only reason for not doing it is that you have to clean up those servers well that's a chemical problem too you can use a uh, you can dunk the server in a liquid that will actually clean the oil off. And, you know, it's it's a different way of thinking about things. But as things go into the hyperscale, as we get more and more into open compute and the types of cooling that will uh, really enable this gigantic cloud that keeps growing and growing and growing, this is going to happen. And it's the reason that you're not going to have computers in your own data center anymore because this is stuff that has to happen at scale you're not going to do it in your own you know backyard you have to have all the 
tools, all the stuff that gets that oil off of the, the server, you have to have that all on site. And man, people like Google, Facebook, Amazon, they can do that. But your small to medium business isn't going to do that. So you're going to be running 100 times less efficiently than these guys. That's why the cloud makes sense. That's why the cloud is green. Because they can do stuff like this. So I see one day that they'll start putting motherboards that just are a series of system on a chip, just socks, plow one next to each other, that have uh, some kind of data fabric between them that can run at 100 gigs and suddenly you have a server architecture that is unparalleled to what it is today. And you can have three in a single U with this immersion cooling. And I think there's every reason to think that that can be done. And man, I, I hate to be an evangelist because I, I see all the problems, but uh, I <laughs> here I am uh, talking up the uh, positives of it. And uh, I haven't really... I've been downplaying the negatives, but they are there, but I still believe in it. Okay. I am sure that there are things that I could have said better or that I have missed, and I would love to hear your comments. Please get to me on Twitter. It's at data underscore good. You can search for my name on LinkedIn. I You can go to our website at uh, www.gooddatapodcast.com I love to hear from you I love all the feedback we've gotten so far it is so refreshing to hear things even if it's negative it doesn't matter please come at me tell me I love to hear from you and that's our show I'd like to thank everyone crazy enough to follow me on this adventure through data center efficiency Again, we're compiling this into an ebook that will be available in fall 2019. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Green Lane Design. Our website is gooddatapodcast.com. And just be good, everybody. We'll talk to you next time on the podcast. <laughs>